trying to start my video, but it won't start. Okay, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Better to leave it off, I think. Um, welcome. Good to see you this morning on this Shabbat day. I hope that you are well rested and that you are here to rejoice and to listen and to be refreshed and renewed by the Ruach HaKodesh. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we're, we're so grateful, we're so thankful for who you are and all that you've done for us this week. I pray that you would still our hearts, help us to discipline our minds, to quiet the chatter of all the things that we've done this week and have to do next week. Father, we lay them aside today and come before you with open hearts to hear you, to worship you, to honor you. I thank you for each one that's here and the families that are represented here today that are present. And I wanna pray from a community rule, the light inside our hearts flow with your wonderful mysteries. May our eyes be privileged to gaze on your eternal realities. For we have beheld wisdom hidden from human beings and knowledge and sagacity sequestered from the sons of men. We have drunk from a fountain of righteousness and from a well of strength. We have swallowed deep drafts from a spring of glory concealed from the assembly of flesh. The track of our steps is over solid, immovable rock. The truth of the eternal is the rock of our steps. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Hassan. Gather and bless Yahweh. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, sovereign of the universe. Barukata Yahweh, Elohim, Melekaholam. Who sanctifies us by your mitzvot and calls us to hear the cold shofar. Asher Kitshah, Nuba Mitzvota, Vitzibah, Nuleshmoa. We call upon our Father and the heavenly realms. Avinu Yahweh Elohim, King of the Universe, let us praise. Our praise, blessings, and prayers rise up through the Shamayim and be joined and magnified through all the ascending levels of the heavens by all who serve you therein, culminating in united, joyful, resounding music and a sweet savor to your very throne and your presence. Blessed be your name. May you hear us on this Kadosh day. Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh God. Blessed is the name of his esteemed realm forever. Baruch Shem Kivot Malkuto Leolam Vayet. We bless the Blessed One, Barku. Barku at Yahuwah Hamevarach, Baruch Yahweh Hamevarach Leolam Vayet. Bless Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it kadosh. <clears throat> Six days will you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahweh, your Elohim, 
in it, he will not do any work. For in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why Yahweh blessed the seventh day and made it Kadosh. Speak also unto the children of Israel, saying, Above all, my Shabbatot you will keep. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. The Israelites are to observe the Shabbat, celebrating it for the generations to come as an enduring covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. And it will come to pass that from one new month to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to worship me, says Yahweh. Mika Malka. Who is like you, O El Elyon of Yisrael, in heaven and on earth, that he can perform in accordance with your great works and your great strength? Who is like your people, Yisrael? whom you have chosen for yourself from all the peoples of the lands, the people of the covenants, learned in statutes, enlightened in understanding. Shield of Abraham. O king, helper, savior, and shield. Blessed are you, Yahweh, shield of Abraham. Baruch atah Yahweh, Magen Avraham. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the Universe. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam. Who has given us the Torah of Truth. Asher natan lanu Torah emet. And has planted everlasting life in our midst. We bless Moshiach. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, sovereign of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation and Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu derech ha-Yeshua, b'moshiach Yeshua. So with joy we draw living water from the springs of deliverance. Ushaptim kayim mayim besason mi maynai ha-Yeshua. Have mercy upon me, O Elohim, according to your loving kindnesses, according to your multitude of mercies. Cleanse me from my iniquities. Purify me with the hyssop. Wash me whiter than snow. Me <clears throat> Have joyful gladness, cleanliness shall I finally know. Amen. Your minister Shalom. Shalom Malachim. Shalom be yours, ministering Malachim, Malachim of the El Elyon coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Kadosh One. Blessed is He. 
Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi Hayon, Mihi Melech, Malachi Hamlakim, Akadosh Baruch Hu. May your coming forth be in Shalom, Malachim of Shalom, Malachim of the El Elyon, coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Kadosh One, blessed is He. Boakem le Shalom, Malachi HaShalom, Malachi Elyon, Mihi Melech, Malachi HaMlakim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Bless us with Shalom, Malachim of Shalom, Malachim of the El Elyon, coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Kadosh One, blessed is He. Barku ni le shalom, Malachi ha shalom, Malachi Elyon, mi melek, Malachi ha mlakim, Akadosh Baruch Hu. There are two roads, one of life and one of death. There's great variance between the two. First of all, we will care for Elohim who brought us into being. Secondly, you will care for your neighbor as yourself. All that what we would not have happened to us, we will make sure does not happen to another. Yahweh Elohim created humans to rule over the world appointing for them two spirits in which to walk until the time for his set for his visitation. These are the spirits of truth and falsehood. An upright nature and destiny originate in the territory of light. A perverse nature originates in the fountain of darkness. The authority of the Prince of Light extends to governing of all righteous people. So of course they walk in the paths of light. Likewise, the authority of the angel of darkness grips the government of all vile people. So naturally they walk in the paths of darkness. Yet the Elohim of Yisrael and the Malak of his truth aid all the sons of light. It is actually he who created the spirits of light and darkness, making them the foundation stone of everything done. Their impulses, the reason for every act. Elohim's love for one spirit endures forever. He will always be pleased with such acts, but the counsel of the other he hates, despising its every impulse for all time. Here are their operations in the world. One lights up a person's mind, straightening the pathways before him in true righteousness and causing his heart to respect the laws of Elohim. This spirit produces humility, patience, great compassion, continued goodness, insight, understanding and powerful wisdom resonating to each of Elohim's works, kept by his constant faithfulness. It produces a spirit knowledgeable in every plan of action, zealous for the laws of righteousness, devoted in its thoughts and unfaltering in purpose. This spirit encourages plenty of compassion on all who hold tightly to the truth and magnificent clarity combined with an instinctive hatred of impurity in its every disguise. It results in humble conduct combined with wide-ranging discernment, with an ability to conceal truth, that is, the mysteries of knowledge. So the earthly counsel of the Spirit works to these ends for those whose character yearns for truth. Through a gracious visitation, all who walk in the Spirit will know healing, bountiful peace, long life, and a prodigious family, followed by enduring blessings and continual joy through a long-lasting life. They will receive a crown of favor with a robe of honor, dazzling forever and ever. Let us choose life. Let us choose to be sons and daughters of life. Amen.
So for our sevenfold millennial prayer, this is a time for you to unmute your mics and join in. And we will agree with you and lift up those needs and prayer requests and things that you have on your heart that you want to share during this time. Abba Yahweh, we pray for the presence of Perusia of the Master, Yahshua. The return of Yahweh's ordinances to bless all people. The elect, the Kadoshim, the Zadokim, and all martyrs and witnesses. I'd like to lift up Brother Henry Roth today in Finland, a man who was active with us for quite some time, and then he just disappeared. Um, we found out with a letter from him that he is in prison. And he's facing a murder charge, which, of course, he said that he, he's not guilty of that. And I don't believe that a man of Torah, a man of Yahweh, can possibly do that kind of damage. Uh, it's just too soft a heart for that. So I want to lift him up in Jokela prison on an island in Finland to you today and ask you to continue to pray for him, and I'll reveal more about him and his plight as time goes on. But his name's Henry Roth. He's uh, in deep study there in prison of Torah and always has been. And we pray now, Father, that you might rightly judge him. If he's guilty, let him pay the penalty. But if he's not guilty, guilty. We pray that you would set him forth uh, and as a free man to go forth and do the good that he will do in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. We pray for the elect, the Kadoshim, the Zadokim, and all martyrs and witnesses. Father, for those three families in one village in Laos who became believers, a total of 13 people, and these families that are wanting to know you and serve you and are being persecuted through the authorities that have accused them of following a foreign religion and imprisoned them as well. I pray that they're able to receive the documentation that they don't need to be in fear of these persecutors and I pray for their faith. I pray that it's a testimony to their new life in Messiah and that their village will see other families and come to know him as well. We pray for Shalom of Yerushalayim chiefly and Shalom on earth. Pray for the restoration of all creation and the advent of equitable justice for all living creatures. Pray for the manifestation of the visible reign of the master over all the world, that he will be manifested in the saints and the believers by our actions and how we live our lives in the fear of the most high. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Abba, we remember our Mavakarim, our overseers, Avarim, Seferim, the Shotarim, Shamashim, the Morim, our teachers, the Rohim of the Ahad, and all the people who share our faith and vision. Amen. We hear the word and teach you. Marukata Yahweh, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshahanu B'mitzvotav, B'tzibahonu La'asok, 
but deep break to Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Let the prophets prophesy. Whenever the ark set out, Moshe said, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee before you. Amen. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's my turn today, and I'm going to go on with uh, number three in uh, number four in ancient sermons, sermons before 100 AD. I've got some pictures to show you because we're going to go over to Corinth today. Here's a map of Corinth in that area. This is Hellas right here. That is Greece, Greece and Macedonia today. And it was the same at that time. We see the variance between Corinth and Rome, quite a ways in distance. Right across the sea is Ephesus, and down here we have Jerusalem. So you can see that Corinth is right on the water. And uh, let me move my bar here. And this is what it looks like from the sky. You can see there's a canal through it. Wow. Here's a reconstruction of ancient, Co ancient Corinth. And as you can see, it's Roman in every way, though, of course, it is found in Hellas or Greek, Greece. We have here the arena and the square blocks for street, which are on the Roman model. Well, here's a map of Europe, an old map. I just want you to take a look for a minute because we'll go back to this. And we want to consider right now where Paul might have gone from here in Rome after Acts 28 is completed. Because I do believe, and there is evidence that Paul went on from Rome after he was let loose from his prison in persecution, and that he went much farther. In the message today, we have Clement. That is the same Clement that we find in the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the Clement that was the successor to Peter uh, as Bishop of Rome by many traditional sources. And in his message today, he tells us in a very real way without mentioning where that Paul went on. Today's message is about schism. That is a problem in an assembly in which one group tries to take over the other. Okay, I can get off that now. There's some question as to which bishop or mevaker that Clement was before Rome, after Kepha, Peter. And some sources say fourth bishop and some say second. In the Nazarene Acts, we find a letter there from Kepha, Peter, that gives Clement the bishopric upon his death. And at the time, Peter is actually dying in that letter. It's a precious letter, and it's a rare letter. Very few people know it, and it didn't make the scripture for some reason. But 
uh, Clement did take Peter's place in Rome as the Milwaukee bishop. And he was one of the big three in the second generation from the apostles. We're still talking about before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, along with Polycarp and Ignatius of Antioch. This is called the first epistle of Clement, addressed to the believers in the city of Corinth, of course. Based on the internal evidence, some scholars say the letter was composed sometime before 70 AD. That is very close to the time of the martyrdom of both Peter and Paul, who are mentioned in this letter. Common time given for the epistle's composition is between 92 and 96. That's way too late, as you'll see. I just love some of these rarer documents that give us an idea of what's going on historically there in the old country. So we can better date the scriptures that we have. And certainly this one, I believe, shows a dating between 62 AD and 69 AD. That is very early, very early. In fact, it is earlier than, uh, much earlier than the canon that we have. So in Clement's two letters, he mentions scriptures from other sources than what are canonized today. It's very interesting. Evidently, Peter and Paul had recently died martyrs, and we estimate that to have happened somewhere between 60 and 68 AD. So we also find in this letter that the temple still stands and is still counted on for the daily sacrifice. And of course, the daily sacrifice ended with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we believe that this Clement of Rome, or Romanus, is the same as the Flavius Clemens, of course, that we have read about over and over again in the Acts. Flavius Clemens was a cousin of the emperor Domitian, and Domitian had him executed because of his foreign superstition. That happened about 95 AD. His foreign superstition, of course, was Jewish Christianity or Nazarene Christianity. And he died along with Epaphroditus and probably Josephus and several others that are mentioned in and out of scripture at that time, at the same time, 95 AD. And we're going to find those historical markers in here and uh, what happens in a schism is one side takes over the church or the assembly one side with usually a different theology than those that are already in power in the assembly so there have been scholarly questions about who was in power and who tried to take over they usually say that we've got a pauline church there in corinth one that follows the, the, the works of Paul, and that either the Essene believers tried to take over, or some other charismatic type movement, like the Montanists of that time, tried to take over. And evidently, their schism was successful. It could be just the opposite way around, that in the Corinth assembly, the uh, Zadokites, the Torah people were in power and they were taken over by the Paulite people. Now, we just don't know. There are hints in here. And in some cases, if the Torah observing group took over Corinth assembly from the Pauline group, maybe that was not such a bad thing after all. But here we'll start the message. And I'm going to just do um, excerpts because this is quite, quite long. We don't want to keep you all day. Chapter one, the Kahal of Elohim, that is the assembly of Elohim, which sojourns in Roma. 
to the Kahal, the assembly of Elohim sojourning in Corinth. To them that are called and sanctified by the will of Elohim through our master Yeshua, the anointed, favor unto you and shalom from the almighty Elohim through Yahshua the anointed be multiplied, owing, dear brethren, to the sudden and successive calamitous events that have happened to us, we feel that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points that you consulted us about. So it looks to me like Clement is writing back to Corinth from Rome, and especially to that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the Bakarim, the elect of Elohim, which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled to such a pitch of frenzy that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be universally loved, has suffered grievous injury. injury. For whoever dwelt even for a short time among you and did not find your faith to be as fruitful a virtue as it was firmly established, who did not admire the sobriety and moderation of your righteousness in the anointed, who did not proclaim the magnificence of your habitual hospitality, and who did not rejoice over your perfect and well-grounded knowledge, for you did all things without respect of persons and walked in the commandments of Elohim. Now that is a giveaway. Walked in the commandments of Elohim, being obedient to those who had the rule over you and giving all fitting honor to the overseers among you. You enjoined youth to be of a sober disposition and serious mind you instructed your wives to do all the things with the blameless becoming in pure conscience, loving their husbands as their duty, and you taught them that if living in the rule of obedience, they should manage their household's affairs becomingly and be in every respect marked by discretion. Now, what he's talking about there is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. He's looking back a generation and talking about the great virtues of the Corinthian assembly at that time. And as you remember, there was a problem between uh, men and women there that was marked out by Paul in his uh, first Corinthians letter. And here we have maybe 10 years later, something has happened, uh, no more certainly than 20 years later, as we'll see in a minute. Moreover, you were all distinguished by humility and were, past tense, in no respect puffed up with pride, but yielded obedience rather than exhorted it, and were more willing to give than to receive, content with the provision that Elohim had made for you and carefully attending to his words, you were inwardly filled with his doctrine and his sufferings were before your eyes. Thus, a profound and abundant shalom was given to you all, and you had an insatiable desire for doing good, while a full outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh was upon you all, full of kadosh designs. You did, with true earnestness of mind and a righteous confidence, stretch forth your hands to Elohim Almighty, beseeching him to be merciful unto you, if you had been guilty of any involuntary transgressions. Day and night you were anxious for the whole brotherhood, that the number of Elohim's Bakarim might be saved with a mercy and a good conscience. You were sincere and uncorrupted and forgetful of injuries between one another. Every kind of faction and schism was abominable in your sight. You mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors, their deficiency you deemed your own. You never grudged any act of kindness, being ready for every good work, adorned by a thoroughly virtuous and religious life. You did all things in the fear of Elohim. The commandments and ordinances of Yahweh were written upon the tablets of your hearts." Every kind of honor and happiness was bestowed upon you, and, may I add, still is, and then was fulfilled that which was written, my beloved ate and drank, 
and was enlarged and became fat and kicked. From that flowed emulation and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and disorder, war and captivity. So the worthiness rose up against the honored, those of no reputation against the renowned, the foolish against the wise, and the young against those advanced in years. For this reason of righteousness and shalom are far departed from you now, inasmuch as every one abandons the fear of Elohim and has become blind in his faith, neither walks in the ordinances of his appointment nor acts as a part becoming to the anointed, but walks after his own lusts, resuming the practice of an unrighteous and ungodly envy by which death itself entered into this world. Ah, do anti-Torah people run the assembly of Corinth and then Torah-bound commandment keepers come in and take over? It sounds like that to me. Let's go to the next section. I'm skipping around here because there are many, many scriptural examples in this letter, and we know the scripture very well, so we're going to skip some of those examples and get down to the historical parts of this letter. But do not dwell upon ancient examples. Let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Let us take the noble examples furnished in our own generation. In our own generation. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the Kahal have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter through the unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors. And when he had at length suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of Kavod, owed to him. On account of envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned. After preaching both in the East and West, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limits of the West, and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the Kadosh place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. Now, you remember that picture of the map of Europe. Let me go over to that again. Clement just spoke of Paul as going to the westernmost parts of Europe. Well, that certainly wouldn't be Rome, which is right about there. Let's see where this goes. It's too, too big. What does it look like to you might be the westernmost part of Europe? Here we've got the Hispanic Peninsula. And here to the left looks to me like the farthest west. That's what we call Portugal today. And in those days it was called um, Lusitania. There we go. It looks like right here someplace on this ancient map, is the farthest west and maybe Britain here, the greater Britain, maybe comes in second. I don't really know the perspective of this map, but that's close enough for our, us right now. So what Clement is saying is that Paul went from Rome in just the past few years and journeyed to the westernmost part of Europe, and then we have the Acts 29, the Sonini manuscript that tells us that he went right on up to Western England or Siluria, as it was called at that time, Wales. And over here to London, where 
also historical references tell us that that place where St. Paul's Cathedral is, was his headquarters in Britain. And in that letter, it also tells us some of his people there with him in Britain, among them were Druids and were senators. And then the Acts 29, Sonini says he came back via the coastland, came through Gaul, around here to Helvetia or Switzerland. He went to the place where Pilate had, Pilate had uh, committed suicide, drowned himself, according to that, and then back here to Rome. So we see some evidence in Clement and some other places that Paul actually did go to Spain, what they called Spain at that time, and that he did come around here to uh, the southern parts of Great Britain, and then took the long way, the continental way back here. Would that we had some letters from that time, all we have are some traditional references that are really worth looking at. And did you know that he said that these martyrdoms came in his own generation, that they had all witnessed that happening? We don't know where, you know, we've got tradition about Peter and Paul, that they were martyred, certainly not by Nero, that would have been too early. We're thinking that maybe they were martyred, maybe at the end of Nero's reign, that would be in the mid-60s, and this letter couldn't have been written any later than just a few years afterwards. Scholars want to tell us time after time that some of these books of the Bible and some of these early letters were written a hundred years later. And as such, they became pseudepigrapha, that is false writings written by someone else, uh, purporting to be Paul or Peter. But we see other traditional material here that tells us that if Clement wrote this letter, it gives us an idea of when Peter and Paul did go to martyrdom and the fact that Clement and his group there in Corinth or in Rome were witnesses to this very thing. Now I've got one more notation about Portugal or Lusitania. Let me show you a little something. This is Cabo de Roca. This is the westernmost land area of Europe. And that's exactly what this says up here at the top in the, uh, what, uh, in the inscription here on the board, as you can see it over here too. And there you see the Atlantic Ocean and up here's a lighthouse. That's an interesting place. I looked at it quite a bit. Ponta Mes Occidental do Continente Europe. In Portuguese, the westernmost province of the continent of Europe. A beautiful place, too. So maybe the map didn't change in the time of Clement. Maybe, indeed, this is the exact place where Paul got off in Hispania, in Spain. The whole continent was also known as Spain. Portugal was the province of Lusitania. If you look into these things a little closer, you will see that there are some evident hints in the history. By the way, if you want to look up Cabo de Roca, the name of that means spindle handle. I don't exactly understand that. Latitude 38, 47, longitude 9, 30. To these men who spent their lives in Kadosh practices, there is to be added a great multitude of Bakarim, who, the elect, 
who having through envy endured many indignities and tortures, furnished us with a most excellent example. Through envy, those women, the Danaids and the Durkai, being persecuted, after they had suffered terrible and unspeakable torments, finished the course of their faith with steadfastness, and through the weakened body, received a noble reward. Envy has alienated wives from their husband and changed that saying of our great father Adam, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Envy and strife have overthrown great cities and rooted up mighty nations. As for these Danaids and the Durkai, these people mentioned as women who were tortured for their faith, This is what a footnote that I found says. It's entirely possible that the reference to the Danaids alluding to how the daughters of Dana, Danaeus were given as prizes to the winners of a race may be indication of how some believing women endured public rape before their executions. Likewise, other Christian women were executed as the Durke of Greek myth, tied to the horns of a bull and dragged to death. As horrific as these things are to think about, they're hardly without precedent in this very period. If one takes into account this first century evidence and considers it in light of the trajectory of violence perpetrated against women believers, as is, as is described in so many of the late martyrdoms, we must conclude that the execution of Peter's wife for her faith is fully within the realm of possibilities. So here we have some evidences that are set out here by Clement of the terrible martyrdoms of some of the wives and the women, believing women, that we don't hear about very often. They're not written of very often. And there are some books that are written concerning them, but not many. Another historical marker. So Clement continues, it's right and kadosh therefore, people and brethren, rather to, than to obey Elohim, than to follow those who through pride and sedition, that's rebellion, having become the leaders of a detestable emulation. It doesn't sound like a Torahful assembly would be detestable to Clement. It sounds more like an anti-Torah fellowship might be detestable to Clement. For we shall incur no slight injury, but rather great danger if we rashly yield ourselves to the inclinations of those who aim at exciting strife and tumults, and in the assembly there are always those people, so as to draw us away from what is good. Let us be kind one to another after the pattern of tender mercy and benignity of our Creator, for it is written, the kind-hearted shall inhabit the land, and the guiltless shall be left upon it. But transgressors shall be destroyed from off the face of it. And again, the scripture says, I saw the ungodly highly exalted and lifted up like the cedars of Lebanon. I passed by, and behold, he was not. And I diligently sought this place and could not find it. Preserve innocence and look on equity, for there shall be a remnant to the peaceful man. So, continuing, he says, let us cleave, therefore, to those who cultivate shalom with righteousness. Evidently, this was a really good, big overthrowing of the Corinthian assembly soon after the death of Paul. Uh, it sounds to me like almost a riotous rebellion, and not to those who hypocritically profess to desire it. For the scripture says in a certain place, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They bless with their mouth, but curse with their heart. 
And again, it says, they loved him with their mouth and lied to him with their tongue, but their heart was not right with him. Neither were they faithful to his covenant. Let the deceitful lips become silent and let Yahweh destroy all the lying lips and the boastful tongue of those who have said, let us magnify our tongue. Our lips are our own. Who is master over us? For the oppression of the poor and the sigh, sighing of the blind will now arise, says Yahweh. I will place him in safety. I will deal confidently with him. Take heed then, beloved, lest his many kindnesses lead to the condemnation of us all. For thus it must be, unless we walk worthy of him, and with one mind do those things that are good and well-pleasing in his sight. For scripture says in a certain place, the spirit of Yahweh is a candle, searching the secret parts of the belly. Let us reflect how near he is, and that none of his thoughts or reasonings in which we engage are hidden from him. It is right, therefore, that we should not leave the post that his will has assigned us. That's good advice. Let us rather offend those men who are foolish and inconsiderate and lifted up and who glory in the pride of their speech than offend those that offend Elohim. Let us reverence the Master Yahshua, the anointed, whose blood was given for us. That theology is still going at this time. The atonement. Let us esteem those who have the rule over us. Let us honor the aged among us. Let us train up the young men in the fear of Elohim. Let us direct our wives to that which is good. Let them exhibit the lovely habit of purity in all their conduct. Let them show forth the sincere disposition of meekness. Let them make manifest the command that they have on their tongue by their manner of speaking. And let them display their love, not by preferring one another, but by showing equal affection to all that piously fear Elohim. Now let your children be partakers of true training. Let them learn of how great avail humility is with Elohim how much the spirit of pure affection can prevail with him, how excellent and great his fear is, and how it saves all those who walk in it with a pure mind. For he is a searcher of the thoughts and desires of the heart. His breath is in us, and when he pleases, he will take it away. I'm glad to hear in this message about placing the children in education. What kind of education? Education in the Torah. As we know, in Corinth, as far as we know, there was nothing but Roman education, which mainly concerned itself with rhetoric and theology. Theology would be the Roman pagan theology of many gods and new gods all the time. They must have had a school there for children to go to that they could get the training they needed with the ways of Elohim. Or maybe we are taught that the parents are to train them in the ways of Elohim at home. Hey, we have a real crisis in our educational system today, much worse than 10 years ago with this critical race theory. If you've read anything about that, it is racist to the core. Can you imagine children in the earlier grades getting that kind of training, really to hate other races, and really for white people to hate ourselves? It is extremely dangerous for youth to have to be trained up in those kinds of things. They're just lies and untruth. All right, I have to find where I was again. I lost my place here. What can we do about that?
How blessed and wonderful, beloved, are the gifts of Elohim. Life in immortality, splendor in righteousness, truth in perfect confidence, faith and assurance, self-control in separateness. And all these now fall under the cognizance of our understandings. What then will those things be that are prepared for such as wait for him? Oh, we wait in hope. The creator and father of all worlds, the most separate, alone, knows their amount and their beauty. Beauty. Let us therefore earnestly strive to be found in the number of those that wait for him in order that we may share in his promised gifts. But how, beloved, shall this be done? If our understanding be fixed by faith toward Elohim, if we earnestly seek the things that are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things that are in harmony with his blameless will, and if we follow the way of truth, casting away from us all unrighteousness and iniquity, along with all covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering, and evil speaking, all hatred of Elohim, pride, and haughtiness, vainglory and ambition, for they that do such things are hateful to Elohim, and not only they that do them, but also those who take pleasure in them that do them. For scripture says, but to the sinner Elohim said, why do you declare my statutes and take my covenant unto your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast off my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him, and you made your portion with adulterers. Your mouth has abandoned, has abounded with wickedness, and your tongue contrived deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought, wicked one that I should be like to yourself, but I will reprove you and set yourself before you. Consider now these things, that you forget Elohim, lest he tear you into pieces like a lion, and there be none to deliver. The sacrifice of praise, the tauda, will give me the kavod. And a way is there by which I will show him the salvation of Elohim. And look, we're believers, but we all find ourselves doing these things. There's one in there that seems to be a church specialty, and that is gossip. It seems to me, like Clement said, can't we put ourselves before ourselves, before Elohim puts ourselves before us, that we can see ourselves as we are. And there are those who say, grace has wiped away my sin for once and forever, giving them a license to go ahead in the things of the world that they have been taught as children because they've seen their parents doing them. I'm going to give this up here because of the time. But let me continue on by saying, this gives us, so far in this message, a lot to think about. Who hasn't been through uh, a church takeover, for instance, or a church breakup, or a group breakup? How many times have we broken up in the time that we've been together? Several times. The seditious are always among the kadoshim, the set-apart people. It's not Elohim who places those people in, but it is the devil who attempts them in because they won't look at themselves in the mirror. Let's look at ourselves in the mirror and continue in shalom. That's one thing we learn here. And one thing that we are convicted of is where our nation under Elohim, so it is said, has gone with 
this unrepentant anti-Christ doctrine of not only critical race theory, but also hand in hand with communism that we all fought so strongly in the 60s and 70s and so feared at the time and were so confirmed that it was conquered that now has come in like a flood. There is nothing good about communism and there's nothing practical about socialism. And as for capitalism, hey, are we not citizens of the dominion of the beloved son? This is not our home, but for a short time. Our permanent home is somewhere else, says the writer of Hebrews. That is where our citizenship must first be. But as people of the heavens sent here, it is also our job not simply to try to make converts, but to salt our world again and salt our nation with salt that purifies. It has just gotten away from us. And we who have little power do have one power still, and that is the power of the microphone, the power of the loud voice, the power of email, the power of PDF, the power, yes, of YouTube. People want to leave YouTube because it's ungodly. That's where all the heathens are. It's like the pastor that said, well, I wouldn't go anywhere around a can of Bud Light beer, so I couldn't go into a bar. Oh, no? While your master sits at table with tax collectors and sinners, and you can't be light in a dark place, those that are abandoning these dark places either, number one, should, because they're weak, or should not, because their witness is strong. And then, if they're going to stay, expect persecution. Expect censorship. Expect having your channel shut down, or being kicked off of Facebook, or being a part of what other people think are a deep, dark, violent, cult in American in America made up of militia people and people that are not satisfied with the wonderful way the country is going. Amen. You are my sons and daughters. This day I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And again, he says to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That hasn't happened yet. Sit there at his feet, at his right hand, until the battle is won. But who are his enemies? All the wicked and those who set themselves to oppose the will of Elohim. Then the third thing we get is a wonderful group of historical markers that tell us in rather cryptic terms what happened after these great apostles were taken out of the world and quickly after. We are told that nobody knows what happened after the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. Nobody knows, but here is strong evidence. And I've only read a small part of this message. There's much more in there. 
This is a strong witness by a very early believer, not only a believer, but the secretary of Peter himself, the one mentioned and greeted by Paul in one of his letters, I think Philippians. And here it is for us, not studied. Would you believe this used to be in the Bible, in the early canon? It was in there, but taken out, taken out. It's too commandment-centric. So I have this for you if you'd like to go through a little more and study it. Or if you'd like to read the preaching part of it, it would help to strengthen your soul. In the meantime, let us go to his right hand. Father, you have known this letter for centuries. Help us to take what's written in this ancient tract that has been taken out by the seditionists in our faith and set aside. Help us to do what this says in regards to the commandments so that we can be the salt and light to this ever darkening world. Help us not to abandon the dark places, but strengthen us instead. Strengthen us to make a difference, to turn on one little light or light a candle. And as far as our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren go, let us take some of the authority uh, from your throne and let us anoint them with that. Let us lay hands on them in faith and believe. Let us speak words that will cut the soul in two and bring around conviction and the convincing of the mind so that we may do the best for all our neighbors, dark or light. And as for the dark, that they might see the light and they might be delivered from their demonic bondage and their black hearts. We pray these things in the name for the sake and of the teaching of Yahshua HaMashiach, in which we are confident and blessed. Amen. Thank you, Heisen. We pray the Master's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in the sky, may your name be sanctified. Vinu shama shama yim yikadeshim da. May your reign be blessed. Your will be done in sky and land. Ba yi barek maku karet senaka ya hesaswi ba shamayim uba haretz. Continually give us our bread, forgive us our sin debts, as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Baitien lak menu ta aridit umi kalanu. Kito tenku ka asher amaknu, makalim la kotim lanu. Do not bring us into the nets of a snare. Ve alta vi enu le deni seyon. And protect us from the evil one. Amen. Our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the Torah. I pledge allegiance to the Torah. Of the beloved son's nation. Of the beloved son's nation. And to the divine theocracy for which it stands. 
and to the divine theocracy for which it stands. One Eloha, one nation, one head. One Eloha, one nation, one head. One faith, one attitude, one goal. One faith, one attitude, one goal. One baptism, one communion, one body. One baptism, one communion, one body. All ordained by Yahweh, the creator. All ordained by Yahweh, the creator. Our nation is surely indivisible. Our nation is surely indivisible. With divine liberty, equitable justice. With divine liberty, equitable justice. And eternal life for all. Hallelujah. Amen. And eternal life for all. Hallelujah. Amen. We minister shalom. May your departure be in shalom. Malikim of shalom. Malikim of the El Elyon. Coming forth from the sovereign of sovereigns. The Kadosh one. Blessed is he. Zekem le shalom malake ha shalom malake elyon ni melek malake hamlakim hakados baruku. We sing the song of peace. Shalom to you now, shalom, my friends. May Yahweh's mercy bless you well, you well my friends. friends. In all your living and through and your, your loving, Yahweh be your shalom, 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 shalom. Yahweh, Yahweh be, be your shalom. shalom. Good. The blessing. Yiva rekeka Yahweh va yishma reka Yahweh pana valeka vikuneka Yisa Yahweh pana valeka Vyasem leka Lake shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Maranatha. Amen. Be amen. The service is finito. Hey, I want to give the liturgists some kudos here and thanks marcia logue was the host and one of the readers steve mcguire read the bold the people's passages kenneth kimmons did the zoom and gregory professor smith did the hebrew today and i don't think i'm missing anybody and i thank you most of all for coming today i uh feel wonderful in the presence of my friends here whom I love every Shabbat morning. If you know of anybody that would like to be a part and have a service of praise and worship such as we are, look, this is the way the ancient worship was conducted. Or as our president would say, hey man, this is the way they did it in the old times. I've had people say to me, if you could just do a message without the liturgy, or if you could just do the liturgy and forget the message, this is the way they did it. And that's what we're trying to emulate, the primitive faith, trying to get as close as we can, including learning the Hebrew to add something to it and to teach you something as we go along. And speaking of Hebrew, tomorrow, 6.30, We've got our next Hebrew session. What is it, number seven? 
Agreed. Number eight, tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, this same channel. We've got something special right after. At eight o'clock at night, we have Dr. Heston coming on with natural health and healing for Torah keepers, for feast keepers, for the Kadoshim, for the saints. And I'll tell you what, if you never heard Heston talk about health, you, you just simply, what can I say? What he has is so different and makes so much sense, almost going back to the old ways, including using your backyard as your apothecary. Uh, it's going to be good. He's always great. And he'll follow that up later on in July for a second session of this. So come on tonight, eight o'clock and be a part with us and Dr. Heston. Next Wednesday, we have a, a Vero Yahad business meeting or ministry meeting. There are several things that we need to discuss and uh, several things to vote on. And I'll send you an agenda before we get to that time. I might say tomorrow, there's something else. No, not tomorrow, Monday. Uh, we have Liz Goodwin, Lise Goodwin, coming on at noon on Monday. And if you've ever heard Lise speak about the evils of the age and how to conquer them, you've heard nothing, man. Uh, we've done three or four other ones with Lise, who lives in the Ukraine now. She's a, from the United Kingdom. But she has uncovered some things about the COVID vaccine, especially, that are more than shocking. She reports the news that the news won't report. And on Monday at 12 o'clock, she's going to talk about the mark of the beast in today's parlance. And I'm going to open it up for anybody that wants to come. So... Try it at noon if you want on Monday. That'll be good. Last an hour. Anything else here I'm forgetting? Well, then, in the name of the Father and Son, Shalom.